occur to you uh, most often would be say, well, you should have a control group, uh, a group of houses that weren't peak saver houses, and you look at their average usage and then you subtract the difference. That's a pretty obvious way to do it. The disadvantage is that you need a control group. You have to have a bunch of houses that, that weren't enrolled. Or we had it in this case, but that's not always the case. And then you have to ensure that the control group is well matched with the, with the, the treatment group, the peak saver group, and that's not always easy. There are three other techniques you can use without a control group. You could look at what happened with the peak saver houses on non-event days, find similar non-event days, um, but finding similar non-event days is not that easy either. Uh, and then there are a couple of more advanced techniques um, using multiple regression or time series regression uh, that you can use as well. Um, so I'll, I'll expand on those a little bit on the, on the coming slides. So a control group, this is the five event days with the control group thrown in. So in this case, our control group was people in the survey subset who said they had central air conditioners because obviously the peak server group had central air conditioners. And then we took the average of them, uh, and those are the purple lines, uh, and the peak server group are the green lines. So you could just subtract the diff difference between those two. Um, that's one way of doing it. You notice here on August 18th, I think that is, that the control group, the purple line, also seems to take quite a dip there during the peak saver event. That seems to have been a large storm that passed through on that same day, and, and the air temperature dropped quite dramatically over a couple of hours, and so the air conditioner loads in the control group also dropped. Um, an equivalent day, well, you'd like to find a day that's as similar as possible to the event days with the same kind of weather, close in the calendar to the event day, so the other things were controlled for. That's actually very difficult to do. Um, and you might remember last year on Earth Hour, there was a whole debate that went on around how do you calculate the effect of Earth Hour? And it's exactly the same issue. Uh, for Earth Hour, generally what the utilities were doing was a very simple approach like this, trying to find an equivalent day, the, say, you know, the Saturday of the week before, or the same Saturday of the year before, and uh, it's a very simplistic approach uh, that is fraught with problems. An Earth Hour, of course, had a much smaller effect than, than Peak Saver has. Uh, regression, well, for those who are familiar with stats, this is actually a pretty simple regression equation. For those who aren't, it might look intimidating, but you're basically just uh, producing an equation that says I'm predicting my power usage from a whole bunch of factors on an hourly basis, like temperature, humidity, whether it's a normal weekday, or whether it's a weekend or a holiday, whether it's the school term, what month it is, what hour of the day it is, and then a whole bunch of factors that account for the individual events that you're trying to calculate. It's a pretty straightforward equation. The difficulty there is trying to figure out what variables you want to put in there, what uh, independent variables are going to predict power draw. And that's an art in itself. And then finally, this time series regression. Now, this equation wouldn't fit on the slide. Um, but the, basically, it's a technique that's very popular in economics that takes account of the fact that these hours that you're predicting are not independent of each other. Power use at 3 o'clock probably depends on power use at 2 o'clock and at power use on 1 o'clock, because if you're at home and you've started things that use power earlier, they're going to affect power later in the day as well. So you can start to put in those effects as well. And in principle, that should be the most accurate way of all of doing it, but it's also the most complex way of doing it. So we did it all four ways with this data set, and you get four different answers. Uh, these are the five event days. These are the event hours, and you'll notice the event hours are slightly different depending on the day when the event started, which four hour period it was. These are the four methods I just talked about, and the numbers here are the percentage reduction estimated by the four methods. Uh, one obvious trend you can see there is typically the, the effect size is larger earlier in the event than later in the event, and that's what you'd expect. When you increase the thermostat by two degrees, then typically what happens immediately is the air conditioner goes off and you save some power, but then of course the house starts to warm up. When now the house hits the new thermostat set point two degrees higher, all the air conditioners come back on again. And so over that four hour period, uh, your saving tends to decline. Um, another thing you might notice just by looking at all the numbers is that the, the different, uh, different techniques differ in their estimates of the effect size by a factor of 50% to, to 200%. So, and that's important. If you're a utility, you're know, trying to put together an incentive program to get people to participate in this, 
then whether the saving is estimated as 10%, 20%, or 30% is a, is a big effect on how, how much of an incentive you should put into the program. Um, something else you might notice about simple regression is on this one particular day, September, it actually suggests that the peak saver caused an increase in electricity use. Now, that wasn't the case. I think it's pretty obvious uh, if we look back at the graph for that day. Um, there was an effect. It wasn't very big on that day, but there was an effect. The green line does obviously go down. And the problem there is the regression equation clearly doesn't include some things that were important on that day. And so generally, power use was higher that day for other reasons. We don't really know what they were. But simple regression doesn't capture that whereas time series regression does and the other techniques do. So there's, there's pluses and minuses with all these techniques. Now you can apply, we've, we've looked at the average energy use across all the houses there in that analysis. You can actually apply the regression techniques to individual houses as well and give yourself now a, an idea of which houses contributed the most to the overall effect. So here I've plotted for each individual house from the simple regression method, uh, the effect on power draw at the first event, the first peak zero event in the first hour. So anything that's positive would mean that the house is actually using more power than normal in that hour. Anything that's negative, the house is using less. So anything to the left of this arrow are houses that are using less than you would predict them normally to, have, to use. Um, then you have the question of, well, which houses then really are participating? Is it just every house that had a, a negative number here? Well, some houses would have, would have used less power that hour anyway, just by, just by chance, by random effects or whatever. Uh, but about 79% of houses used less power in that first hour of the event. If you say, well, I'm going to have a higher criteria than that, let's say 0.3. They've got to reduce it by 0.3 to really count as having an effect. Well, then it's 68%. If you say it's going to be 0.3 and statistically significant, you know, a formal way of giving us a feeling that the effect is not just by chance, then we're down to 27% of households. So depending on, again, how you, what criteria you apply, it could be that only a minority of households in any particular event that are signed up to Peak Saver are actually participating in a useful and meaningful way. So that's a bit of a problem for utilities, right? They, uh, they'd like to give these incentives to houses that participate, not to ones that don't. Don't give you free money and free thermostats to houses that aren't even going to contribute to the, uh, to the overall result. So it would be nice to look at the data and say, oh, well, before I get into that, there's a whole bunch of reasons why houses might not participate. I won't go into them in, in detail. You can see them, see them for yourself. Um, some of them um, are more likely than others, but there's a whole range of things that could happen. It would be nice for the utility to look at these data and say, you know, is there something about each household that predicts it's going to be a good contributor or not? And if we can figure out what households are more likely to contribute, which ones are less likely to contribute, you know, then we can focus our marketing of these programs on those types of households and get more you know, bang for our buck. Um, the problem is we couldn't do that with this data set because um, the peak saver houses didn't do the survey. But it's an obvious direction for future research to follow. Uh, 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 and look at those issues in, in more detail. And then finally, I'll just point out that this piece of work I just talked about was only part of a larger project at NRC called the PowerNap project that looked at whether we could not just reduce peak power by a, a reasonable dent, you know, 20-30%, but could we take a residential, a typical residential house, and reduce it to zero power draw from the grid during those highest peak demand periods. So what we just talked about is air conditioning direct load control, but there's all kinds of other techniques you could use to reduce peak power from that afternoon high right down to zero. So we looked a bit at that. First of all, we, we'd worked with a, a master's student at Carleton University, did some simulation studies, took the typical residential house and applied various techniques in concert on that house, so shading, air conditioner, load control, uh, smart appliances, uh, uh, energy efficient lighting, ventilation techniques, a whole range of things, and, and use simulation to look at peak load reduction. And then we used the findings of that thesis to do an, a, a final experiment. And here it is, one of the nice facilities that we have at NRC, are two side-by-side full-scale -house, full, full houses, 
where we can do this work. Um, typical suburban houses. The one on the right is the reference house that always stays the same. The one on the left is our test house. And uh, we apply a, a variety of things to the test house. And then we can run the two houses side by side and look at the effect uh, of the measures that we took. So in the test house, we applied a whole set of, set of measures now. Um, air conditioner cycling, the kind of thing we just talked about. We also installed external blinds to get better shading on summer afternoons. We replaced all the incandescent lights with, with compact fluorescent lights. We shifted the use of the washer and the dryer from 7 p.m. to, to 9 p.m., um, assuming a, a, occupants are willing to engage in that behavioral change. Uh, we shut off air conditioning to the basement because that's cooler anyway. And we also said anything that was left over, we could take care of with, with photovoltaic. So we have photovoltaic panels on the next door building, uh, and we sort of virtually took the power from these PV panels and applied it to those houses to see if we could get down to zero from the grid during the peak day. And here's the, and one example result. This was July 21st, 2011. The worst day of the year in one context, it was 38 Celsius. In, Ontario, in Ottawa that afternoon, it was the highest peak demand in Ontario ever. Uh, from that perspective, the worst day of the year. From a different perspective, it was my birthday. <laughs> um, my wife unexpectedly invited friends over for dinner. We were a peak saver program participant. This was the one peak saver day of 2011, so we had guests in. I was cooking dinner. We had no air conditioning. It was an interesting evening. But our, our house wasn't armed against peak loads like the test house was. Let's see how the test house did. Uh, again, we got uh, peak demand from, um, sorry, demand for the houses here versus time of day. Here we have the utility uh, time of use windows that you're probably familiar with here. The area we were doing air, air conditioner cycling on is here. So the red line is what the reference house did. So with no measures. Um, the blue line is an adjustment to the reference house just to take into account the fact that two houses aren't really identical. There's a little bit of difference between them. So the blue line is slightly more conservative estimate of what would have happened without the measures. The green line is what happened in the test house. So you can see that the measures we applied reduced peak by about half um, during the various peak periods we were looking at. Uh, the pink line shows what would have happened if we'd had a slightly more efficient uh, fan. The orange line shows what would have happened if we had a more efficient air conditioner, so we're chipping away again at that load. And then finally, the effect of running the, the photovoltaic power generation through our test house, we would in fact get down to zero during the on-peak period. It's a typical residential house, applying all these you know, reasonable measures individually together in concert, we can actually get the demand for the house during the utility's highest peak period down to zero on the worst day of the year. You'll notice that the overall peak is actually shifted later in the evening, um, and that's because we shifted the washer dryer primarily, which are big draws uh, to later in the evening. Uh, and, but the utility is okay with this peak happening here because by then commercial buildings have dropped off, so overall they want to get load down during this red, red time, which we did very successfully. Um, in terms of temperature conditions indoors, uh, the magenta and the blue lines are the temperature in the two houses. No effect on temperature. The, uh, the better shading in the test house offset the reduced air conditioning, so that was nice. Uh, in terms of humidity, though, air conditioning is, is helpful in taking humidity out of the air, and we didn't have that. So humidity was higher in the test house than in the reference house. It went from about 50% to about 70%, and that is an issue, um, but if you look at the typical uh, recommended levels of combinations of temperature and humidity that uh, are put there as guidelines for comfort, we're still within that comfort zone. So it's slightly more uncomfortable, I would say, but still within accepted practice. So to summarize then, peak saver, our analysis would suggest that peak saver was saving somewhere between 0.2 and 0.9 kilowatt kilowatts on average per household. But it does depend on the method of analysis you use. We recommend time series regression, although it is the most complex thing uh, to use. We do think it gives the best answers. We did notice that only a minority of participants, perhaps, were actually contributing. And that's certainly an area for future work. Uh, and we have shown, though, that uh, using things like peak saver and other methods, we can get uh, peak load down dramatically in the residential setting, which will be very useful to utilities going forward. We may want to look at some policy directions that might encourage that.
in the future. And uh, that is it. Thank you very much. Well, the question again is to repeat it was, uh, I think, primarily about electric vehicles and how that will impact uh, some of these load shapes uh, going forward. It's not an issue that we've looked at ourselves directly yet, but it's certainly an issue that's actively being looked at by other people. And it's definitely being recognized as a, as a potential major issue. Uh, you're right that uh, once those cars get plugged in, you've got this big extra load potentially in the evenings. Um, one way of dealing with that, again, is using more intelligent control. Um, so uh, whether you can offset the, the charging of the battery to middle of the night rather than having them charge the moment you plug them in uh, is one approach. Or maybe offsetting uh, other uh, loads in the house against the charging of the battery. You certainly need a lot more intelligent approaches to do that. And there also is the, the opposite that can occur, again, not an area that we're looking at, but others are, about drawing power off the car. If the car has residual power left in the battery, using that to run the house during peak periods and then recharging the car later on. So that, that's a possibility, but I, I would say it was, it's still a ways away uh, and certainly a, an important area of future work. So why not make demand response permanent since I said there were no complaints during these trials? Uh, I guess my, my answer would be, what I said earlier during the presentation. I, my personally, I've been involved in a lot of studies uh, uh, and other people in a lot of studies that have looked at longer term uh, conditions. Uh, and we certainly find that, uh, that longer term conditions, which are reflected in, in current codes and standards, are the ones that lead to, to beneficial outcomes for occupants. Uh, and so I would still stick by those, that larger body of research on longer term effects and say that those are still the appropriate things uh, to, to do, um, rather than go to lower levels all the time. I think the fact that people don't notice or don't complain within a two-hour time window does not mean that they won't notice and won't complain over a two-day or a two-week or a two-year time window. Uh, and so I'm, I would prefer to be conservative uh, in this regard. I think we have more chance to, to look at that over time as, as demand response becomes more common. Right now it's still pretty rare. I think we need to get the infrastructure in place, uh, and then we can look at, look at how we can use it more effectively going forward. But I prefer to be conservative at, at present. Yeah. Is there a metric for productivity in office space as well? I'll have to come back and give you another one hour talk on that, because <laughs> that's something else that we do a lot of. Uh, I would say in, the, in these particular studies, um, our metrics were, were, were many-fold. Um, first of all, we, we looked at pe whether people fell asleep, and they, and they didn't. So that you know, gets, gets your postprandial nap thing out of the way. Uh, we were asking people in, in that experiment to do uh, typical office tasks. So they were doing things like typing, they were doing proofreading, they were evaluating resumes, uh, they were doing memory tasks throughout the day. We asked them questionnaires about their mood, about their comfort, um, what they remembered from the morning. Um, so we had a whole battery of tests that we asked them. And, Looking at their performance on those tasks and their responses to those questionnaires, um, there, was, there was no effect. Um, and therefore, that's what I mean by, by no hardship. Um, now, again, that was in the context of a few hours in an office laboratory. Um, we haven't looked at those kinds of performance effects over months in a, in a real workplace. It's very difficult to do that because real workplaces often don't have measures in place uh, that would allow you to do that in any meaningful way. Uh, but in the lab, we looked at it quite thoroughly. Okay, the, yeah, the, the cost question <laughs> for, the, uh, for the houses. Um, to put all those measures in place for the house that managed to get us down to zero peak would certainly not be cost effective with current electricity prices and current equipment prices. Um, that's, that's for sure. So, I mean, the, the photovoltaics I talked about are obviously going to be a few thousand dollars. Ex good external blinds are a few thousand dollars. Um, cycling the air conditioner is doesn't cost very much money. You know, that, that's, that's fairly cheap. Replacing the lighting is pretty cheap. Uh, having people move their usage of power is cheap or, or nothing. But you're still talking about several thousand dollars for all the measures that we talked about. And those aren't, aren't going to pay back without other incentives. I mean, the PV prices are coming down pretty rapidly, but uh, they're not going to pay for themselves. So I think one of the important things to take away from this would be um, you can probably um, somewhat save money and not get all the way to zero. We, we wanted to show you, you could get to zero in theory. You could do it with commercially available technology. Um, you may be able to get pretty close to zero at a reasonable price, but getting all the way to zero is probably 
too expensive, but that may change over time. There's also some cultural issues. I mean, external shading is very common in Europe, very rare in Canada. Um, that's partly because of the winters we have in Canada, uh, but partly they're just what, what people are used to. Uh, and if you're more used to external shading, which is the single most important measure, it's much more important than cycling the air conditioner, um, then, then we could maybe bring those prices down and have it happen more often. Uh, uh, the question of complaints again in, in office environments, um, whether different types of tasks could affect the outcome on complaints. Uh, I suppose the answer is yes, I mean, we haven't really looked at that. Um, the, the context in which we did the work was, was looking at typical office work in, in a federal office, as you saw, uh, and whatever happens in a college campus. Um, but we didn't look at other settings. We didn't look at industrial settings, for example. Um, uh, we didn't look at other types of settings. So it's certainly possible that maybe people could, could be more sensitive to these types of things in different work environments. Uh, where maybe visual acuity is really, really important. So where you're dimming lighting, it, they might really notice it uh, more than other places. Um, but I can't really comment any more than that because we didn't, we didn't look at it. It's certainly a possibility, though. The, the, the Peak Saver program itself, uh, it, it's a voluntary program. If you, if you volunteer for it, then, then the utility will come to your house. They will install a special thermostat on the wall. It will re replace your regular thermostat. Uh, it's not something that's inside the air conditioner, it's the thermostat that's changed. Okay. Then, like, can you do the same thing for all light? So, like, you, you dim the light, so you can change it to any light? Yeah, good, good question. You, you could certainly have similar systems in place that would, uh, that would address all the loads in the house, not just air conditioning. You could have uh, a similar system controlling uh, lighting or controlling other appliances. There are a variety of people looking at that issue, a variety of large commercial vendors. Uh, there is some work being done here in Waterloo, I believe, on, on uh, residential control of, of, of multiple appliances. So yes, that, that, that could be done going forward. Yeah, that's, that's a good comment. So complementarity of incentives and, uh, and other programs. Yes, you're right, the, the PV system necessary to get us to zero peak was only 1.6 kilowatts. That's a pretty small installation um, because we're not trying to get to zero energy over the year where you need a bigger system, uh, but zero peak needs a relatively small system. Um, if we think back to commercial buildings and, and dimmable lighting as a, as a demand response scenario, it's certainly true that if you were to build an incentive program around the benefits of, of reducing the peak, it wouldn't be effective. If you start to figure in all the other benefits of dimmable lighting, you can dim lights in response to, to daylight when it's available on, on all days. You can have people dim lights for tasks that need less light on all days. Uh, you start to build in all those various benefits. Then you can come up with a package which, as you say, overall becomes more effective. I think one of the problems we have with these incentive programs is they tend to divide up the benefits um, and, and not look at them collectively. And I think there's definitely potential to to do that going forward, so good, good point. Uh, the, the, the shape of demand uh, curves, the, the three different categories, residential, commercial, industrial, actually do have quite different load shapes. Uh, so what you saw in my, at the beginning of my presentation was of course all of them added together in the overall provincial load shape. Uh, residential uh, peaks in the summer tend to occur in late afternoon, early evening. Commercial peaks in the summer tend to occur in, in more in the mid to late afternoon. Uh, industrial peaks can really occur anywhere depending on the industry. So mi some industries are running 24 hour, three shifts, so their peaks can happen in the middle of the night depending on what the industry is. Um, and they have, often have the ability to shift their load around a lot more than other, uh, other uh, end uses. So industrial peaks can occur anywhere. Uh, and that's actually helped the utility. So when we, when we saw the, the residential peak being shifted dramatically to later in the afternoon by some of the things we talked about in the presentation, because that, that is not coinciding with the commercial peak, that doesn't cause a residual problem. Yeah, so. okay. Guy, I've got a sense that you're not the only one in the room who sees beauty in graphs. I think <laughs> many in this room probably share that, and so we are very appreciative of you sharing those interesting results, and, and the beauty of it as well as you put it in a very nice context, the bigger pictures, issues that are raised. So please join me in thanking Dr. Newsom very much. Thanks, thanks. Thank you.